A thief on each side, Christ was being crucified, paying the supreme sacrifice. But the man on the right side, Christ invited before he died to be with him in paradise. So if you ever want to be on the right side of Calvary, you must go through the blood of the Lamb. And when you go through that crimson flow, it will wash you white as snow. You'll be on the right side of the great I Am. <clears throat> on that great and noble day, some will hear the Father say, Depart from me, for I know you not. But everyone that's on the right side, he'll invite to go inside, cleansed by Calvary from every spot. So if you ever want to be on the right side of Calvary, you must go through the blood of the Lamb. And when you go through that crimson flow, it will wash you white as snow. You'll be on the right side of the great I Am. So if you ever want to be on the right side of Calvary, you must go through the blood of the Lamb. And when you go through that crimson flow, it will wash you white as snow. You'll be on the right side of the great I Am. Take your Bibles and turn with me this morning to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, if you would please stand for the reading of God's Word, if you're able to. Philippians chapter 3. Well, we're looking to have some fun. I thought about, uh, I, asked, I told Curtis, I said, we got your football up there. <laughs> Step out there in the aisle there, Curtis. Now, we're not playing tackle, I can tell you that right now, right? I don't even know if I can throw this thing, but it does bounce, amen? All right, okay, so here we go. <laughs> Lightning heads. Now, if we break something, I'm in trouble behind us. My wife is watching, all right? Okay, well, that was the message today. You can go home. <clears throat> no. Now, we're going to have some fun this week at Vacation Bible School, and of course, you be much in prayer. We will we'll be picking up a lot of kids, and a lot of kids that come to church on Sunday, but a lot of times we'll get other kids coming in. It's an opportunity to get the gospel to them. And we have a little bit of fun with the things, and we use the th a little bit different theme. This year, our theme is pressing toward the mark, and we're actually going to read the verse this morning that uh, that, that theme comes from, and we'll mention a little bit about, about it today. But Philippians chapter 3, we'll begin reading in verse 1, says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write or, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have conf confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. 
And he gives us, he tells us about himself here. He says in verse 5, Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in, in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I count lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through, uh, through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I have already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if I, I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. And this next verse is our, actually our verse for the Vacation Bible School. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, I want you to back up though and look at verse 10, which would be our text this morning. And he says, That I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death. I'd like to preach to you, the journey is about knowing Him better. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the day that You have blessed us with in so many ways. And Lord, we thank You for the Word of God, and Lord, there may... As we read through the Scriptures so quickly, may not have been a lot of understanding there, but Lord, I pray that you give understanding this morning. And of all things, Lord, I pray that each of us would leave here today saying that we know you better. And Lord, I pray that every person here, Lord, if they don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, if they do not know that they'd go to heaven today if they died, I pray that you would deal with their hearts, help them to realize they don't have to leave that way that we can take a Bible and show them how to receive Christ as their Savior. That way they can know that they're going to heaven when they die. But Lord, I pray every Christian here also, Lord, that we would grow in you and live for you in a greater way. Lord, we need you this morning. We want to see you magnified and glorified and lifted up. And so, Lord, I pray that you just give me the words to say. May the Holy Spirit have freedom to work in hearts and lives. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. As I said here, Paul starts out by giving warnings uh, of those things uh, that would lead you astray from, from the Lord and, things, and the things of God. Those who merely have religion and don't really know the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look here in verse 2 and 3, it says, Beware of dogs. And he's not talking about the canine. He's talking about those who would deceive, who would devour. And so he's warning uh, them here, the Philippians here about that. He says, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision, those who would disrupt your life. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Otherwise, he's looking at them and he's saying, listen, there's those who are going to try to get you off track. There's those who's going to try to devour you. There's those who are going to try to mess up your life. Because Satan is walking about, the Bible says, as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. In this room this morning, Satan would love nothing better than to destroy your life, destroy your marriage, destroy any relationships you have, destroy your, your walk with Christ if you're saved, keep you from getting saved if you're not saved. And he desires that and he would constantly work to try to destroy your life. He speaks about that we're to have no confidence in our flesh. You know, a lot of us, we have a confidence in our flesh. Well, I can do just about anything I put my mind to, is what we generally would say. Some people say, well, I've pulled myself up by my, by my own bootstraps. I'm a self-made man. And we put a lot of confidence in our flesh and what we can do. But you know what? Paul said, don't have that type of confidence. Because you can't take care of yourself like you think you can. Otherwise, serving the Lord is not about what we can accomplish. But what about the Lord can do in our lives and what He has done for us that we might have eternal life? You see, many times we get hung up on self. This journey, this life uh, that we're on in, the journey of life, a lot of times we make this life about us instead of about what God wants it to be about. 
And so many times we miss the, the direction the Lord wants to give us. Paul then lays out his credentials as a religious past before he got saved. He kind of lays out what he was, and you know, a lot of people brag about who they are and what they are. And here's what Paul says. He said, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof, he might trust in the flesh. He says, I more. He said, I could trust more in my flesh than most people could. He goes on, he says, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. He said, I kept all the, all the, the, the rules, the regulations. He said, I did everything exactly the way it was supposed to be. He said, I was, he said, I was circumcised at the right time. He said, as a Jew. And he said, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He said, I, and he goes on and he lays out all these credentials. But yet Paul said, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. You may be sitting here this morning and say, well, I'm a pretty good person, preacher, and, and so surely God wouldn't turn me away. Can I tell you something? The Bible says there's none good. None. None. It says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every single one of us, there's none good. And the Apostle Paul said, listen, he said, even though he said, I was a very religious man, he said it wasn't good enough. It wasn't good enough. His religion was about rules and works and before he got saved and before he received Christ as a Savior. Then he sees what it's really truly about. You know, if you're going to, if, if, here in life, you know, a lot of people are confused and, about what life is really about and where they're going in their life, what they're going to do with their life. It all seems like a blur and it all seems like a big mess sometimes. But the Apostle Paul says, listen, he said, I want to tell you what the life is really about. He said, I want to give you some instruction. I want you to understand what it's really about. And because many times we get hung up on it being about us. This journey is not about us, though. In verse 7, it says, But what things were gained to me, notice what Paul says, those I count loss for Christ. He said, everything that I've done, everything that I could attain, all, the, all the, the degrees and all the knowledge and all the, the abilities I had, he said, I count it as loss for Christ. Verse 8, he says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. He said, everything in my life, to be honest, he said, everything that's about me, he said, it's counted as dung. He says, that worthless. He said, well, preacher, surely it couldn't be that way. Where are you going to be in five years from now? He said, well, I'll probably be doing this or doing that. Where are you going to be 20 years from now? Let's step it up a little bit. Where are you going to be 50 years from now? Let's stretch it out a little bit farther for everybody in this room. Where will you be 100? hundred years from today. That's when it tells you what really matters. Amen. That shows you what's really important. Jim, how old are you? 83. 83. Does it seem like it was that long ago that you got your driver's license? He didn't because he lost them, had to go get them. No, I'm kidding you. <laughs> It doesn't seem like that long ago that I was in high school playing basketball. But I'm 53. I started to say 53. I'm 57. I don't even know how old I am. <laughs> Gets that way, God. <laughs> I, it seemed like yesterday I was in high school. It seemed like yesterday I was getting my driver's license. It seems like yesterday and they're having the... the uh, a uh, 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 baby shower for Heather, but it seemed like just yesterday that I remember, and I still remember uh, uh, Heather when brought her home, and she's a little bit older. Put uh, Janine putting her in the in the sink, in the in the bath uh, bathroom, in the bathroom sink, and had bubbles in there, and she was kicking those little, little fat legs back and forth, and she was roly poly, had rolls all over. She ain't got them now. Well, she may have some now, but anyway, <laughs> that seemed like yesterday. 
What really matters? Only that which is going to last for eternity. And the Apostle Paul said, listen, he said, I want to tell you what life is really about. He said, it's really about Jesus Christ. It's not about you. It's not about me. For some reason, every one of us struggle with the, what this journey in life is all about. And it's not about us, but it's about the Lord and, and Jesus Christ, about Jesus Christ uh, and what we do with Him. He created you and you see, He, he created you. You didn't create Him. But He created you for a purpose. In Colossians 1.16 says, For by Him were all things created. Talking about Jesus Christ. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. And then He says, All things were created by Him and for Him. Do you realize this morning that you were not created for yourself, but you was created? You say, oh yeah, preacher, I was, you guys said, you guys up here in front of us said, yeah, I was created for all the ladies, they were, you know, huh? I'm their gift. Wrong. If you don't believe me, just ask the girls and they'll tell you, wrong. Every one of us in here were created for God. You were created for Him. He had a desire, He had a plan when He created you. Somebody in here may say, well, preacher, I, I'm just an accident. I'm not really supposed to even be here. You were supposed to be here or you wouldn't be here. There is no such a thing as an accident in God's schedule. There is no such a thing as you're not supposed to be somewhere when God has a plan for you. And God created you for Him. So then if it's not about us and it's about the Lord, we should desire to know him in even a greater way so that we know what He wants to do with our lives so that we can enjoy what He wants to do for our lives. Hey, can I tell you something? My life got sweeter and it got better the day I got saved. Amen. I've not always been what I should be, but I'm going to tell you something. In 1975, when I received Jesus Christ my Savior, it changed my life. And my friend, I wouldn't go back for anything. Amen. God has blessed in such a miraculous way. And boy, I'll tell you what, I've been through difficulties, been through struggles, been through trials, been through all the problems that you can, I can stand here and name them, but I'm going to tell you something. It was good to know that God was with me through them and brought me through them. Paul said in verse 8, he said, I count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, to know Him, not just to know about Him. Every person in this room, you've heard the name of Jesus Christ. If today, you hadn't before today, you have now. But there's more than just hearing about Him or knowing about Him. It's knowing Him personally. Having a relationship with Him. And that's what life is about. And along the way, the Lord builds things in our life. So, well, preacher, if that's what life is about, I mean, why do we get married and all this sort of stuff? You know, can I tell you this? That part of my life in knowing the Lord has been enriched by being married to Janine and our lives growing together and our lives growing in the Lord and raising a family and facing the trials and facing the difficulties and facing the good times and the bad times together with the Lord. And that has helped us to know Him in a better way. That's what God's got planned for. And so each and every one of our lives is to know Him in a greater way, not just to know about Him. Many people uh, today in church are sitting uh, uh, across America and even around the world. They know about Jesus Christ, but they really don't know Him. And possibly this morning, some of you may be sitting here and you've heard about Jesus Christ. You've been to church. You maybe even as a child went to vacation Bible school and, and heard about Jesus Christ and heard that He died on the cross for you so that you could be saved so that you wouldn't have to go to hell. And you've heard all that and you, you heard that he, that he did all those things for you. You heard how He created the world and, and all these things. You've heard about God. You've heard about Jesus Christ but you really don't know Him. You know about Him. Can I tell you something? I remember basketball players when I was a, when I was young and everything. Will Chamberlain, uh, Larry Bird, and and different ones like that. And I could just keep on naming them and and and, and Magic Johnson. And just name them one after another. You know what? I know about them, but I don't know them. I don't know them. And a lot of people today they know about Jesus Christ, but they really don't know Him. Paul said, "I want to know Him." There's a major difference between knowing Him and just knowing about Him. 
Paul's desire was to know him. He told us there in verse 10, he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. He said, really, what someone needs is they need to build a relationship with Jesus Christ. They need to know him. That, that, that part of, of a Christian, uh, hey, listen, that's a part of many Christians' problem today is that they, they have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, but they've never went on and built the relationship. They've never went on and, and, and grown in the Lord. They've never went on and, and enjoyed the things that God has for them. And, and so they go through life and, yes, they're going to heaven because they accepted Christ as Savior, but they've never walked with God. They've never enjoyed that fellowship with God. They've never built the relationship and, and, and caused it to become strong. And so they're missing out on the blessings of God. But on the other side, there's those who, as I said, have heard about Jesus Christ, but they don't know Him as Savior if you're sitting here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus Christ, your Savior, you know about Him, but you don't know Him. You say, preacher, you mean by just a, 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 a merely coming and receiving Him as Savior that I will begin to know Him? Oh, yes, in a greater way. You see, a relationship requires fellowship, a good fellowship. In 1 Corinthians 1.9, God is faithful by whom you, will, you were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our, our Lord. Every person in this room, if you're saved, you've been called unto a fellowship with Jesus Christ. You say, what do you mean? What do you mean? Come here. Uh, why? Stay right there. We can go through life at a distance from God. And we can, we can know about Him. We can know Him as our Savior. And we can go through life at a distance well, don't at all. And we can have all kinds of things in our lives that separate between us and God. I mean, we can have work, we can have play, we can have money, we can, anything you want to put on the list that's keeping us from getting close to God. And those things aren't bad in the proper place. But there can be all kinds of things that separate us. We can go through life that way knowing about Him as our Savior and never really fellowship Him, or we can spend time with Him and we can go through life side by side and have fellowship with Him, enjoy His presence in our lives, enjoy what He wants to do on a day-to-day -day basis. We can enjoy that fellowship. Or we can stay separated from God. Too many times Christians go through life separated by the things of this world from God. And if I'm going to have a good fellowship with Him, I've got to remove anything that's between me and Him. I've got to get close to Him. Look up here. Not my message, but I'll go ahead and point out. You see this fellow over here praying? Look what's in the middle. Press toward the mark. Look at the target where the arrows are hitting. What's hitting the mark? The Word of God's hitting the mark. That fellow praying's hitting the, hitting the mark. If I'm going to have fellowship with the Lord, I've got to hit the mark. I've got to start trying to aim my life in the right direction and spending time with Him. Thank you, boy. And so if we're going to have that, that fellowship, if we're going to enjoy what God really wants us to enjoy, we're going to have to have fellowship with Him. We've been called to that fellowship, to spend time with Him, walking in fellowship every day. It's more than just going to church. It's more than just reading your Bible. It's more than just praying. It's spending time with the Lord. You realize, hey, listen, a lost person can read a Bible. A lost person can pray. A lost person can go to church. But only those who seek the Lord in fellowship to walk with Him are going to enjoy the fellowship of God. They first must be saved. They must be born again. Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. Our relationship with the Lord is one of the heart. Without the heart being involved, there can be no true relationship. A lot of times we've got it right here. I mean, we've got it up here. We know all the, the ins and outs, but listen, it's from the heart. Do you know why a lot of marriages end today? They made a commitment from here and not from here. When I married my wife, I made a commitment with my heart. My friend, that's what's helped us stay together. 
That's what's helped make the relationship sweet. It wasn't something that we just thought about, oh, it would be nice to be married, you know, see what our kids will look like. You say, praise the Lord, they look like their mother. That's right. <laughs> but it was with the heart. And it's with our heart that we build the relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we many times are quick when we talk about salvation. We go to, to Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. It says, for, with, or, or, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's exactly right this morning. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your Savior, you need to call upon Him and ask Him to forgive you of your sin and come into your heart and life and save you. But listen, back up to verse 10. In verse 10 it says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's with the heart. And it's always been with the heart. Even in the life after you're saved and know Jesus Christ your Savior. Hey, listen, the relationship is built with the heart. You love the Lord. You desire to be close to Him. You want Him to be a part of your life, your love. It's with the heart. And so much today in Christianity is done without the heart. It's done through mechanics and, and programs and, and, and on goes the list of things when it should be done with the heart that we love the Lord with all of our heart. He told us to love, us with all, love Him with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and strength. Everything about us is to love the Lord. To build that relationship with Him, to know Him better. The purpose of the journey in this life is to build that relationship. Philippians 3 there in verse 13 and 14 says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of, of God in Christ Jesus. Putting behind ourselves and the, the, those things, putting self behind me and the things of this world behind me that I might draw near unto the Lord in fellowship, that I might know Him better. Your life is about knowing Jesus Christ. Your life is about walking with Jesus Christ. You say, preacher, I thought my life was about making a living for my family. Hey, that's just something the Lord blesses you with. You say, well, I thought my life was about this and about that. Hey, listen, our life is about the Lord Jesus Christ. Those other things the Lord allows us to have. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. He said, I'll add those things to you. But he said, seek me first. Seek that fellowship with Him. Seek that walk with Him. He said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know, there's a lot of people, and I don't know how many, because this thing's sitting here, I don't know how many see it. I don't know if you've ever shot a bow and arrow, or maybe went out to the range and shot a gun at a target, and you can hit all around this thing. But what's everybody want to do? They want to hit right there. Because that's the dead center of the target. That's where you want to be able to hit. And in your life and in my life, it ought to be a desire, Lord, I want to press toward that mark, the center of your will, where you want me to be, what you want me to be doing, how you want me to live, and to follow Him. But we can't do it when we're loaded down with the things of this world that keeps us from following Him like ourself and the things of this world. We need to put those things away. James 4, 8 says, Draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. There's some things that we need to put out of our lives, Christian, if we're going to hit the mark. If we're going to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of Jesus Christ. We're going to have to put some things away from us and aside. I remember... Several years ago, when I was a youth pastor, we had a man by the name of Dean Blakeney come to a youth conference that we had. We had a youth conference every year for about 14 years. And, and I had this man, he does, he's a karate expert, and he would break all kinds of things, do all kinds of different things. But one thing that he did uh, one year is uh, he come in and he set up a big piece of styrofoam right here in the middle. And he um, <clears throat> had a cabbage. 
and uh, he, he, had a, he, had, he asked for a teenager to stand in front of that, that styrofoam block and put that cabbage on top of their head. He stepped back to, towards the back of the auditorium and he picked up a bow and arrow. And he looked at them. Of course, they began to get nervous. I would too. He said, now he said, it would be, he said I'm, a, I'm a very good marksman. He said, I, he said, I shoot a bow quite a bit. He said, but he said, uh, let's, let's make this a little more interesting. He reached in his back pocket. He pulled out a blindfold. And he put it on. He picks up the bow and arrow and he pulls it up like that. And, he, and all of a sudden he starts shaking a little bit. And the arrow falls off. He reaches back, pulls out another arrow, puts it on there and starts shaking a little bit. Arrow falls off. Finally he stops. He said, I'm just a little bit nervous. He said, it's been a few weeks since I've shot. He said, I'll tell you what let's do. He said, why don't you sit down? He took the, the blindfold off. Had him sit down and we had already made, taken a, a milk jug and we drew a face on it. Eyes, nose, mouth, everything. We took two ice picks and we stuck it in the um, styrofoam and then we took the cabbage and put it on top of it. He stepped back to the back in the middle and he put the blindfold back on, reached down, picked up there like that, reached back and pulled like that and, and let it go. And folks, he was blindfolded. He said, hit the cabbage? No, he went right through the nose on the milk jug. <laughs> Say, what are you saying? That was just a, a routine to, for fun. But to be honest with you, Dean Blakeney could shoot it two or three times easily blindfolded and hit the nose every time. He could hit the mark. But it took practice. And he could do it blindfolded. He had a sense about him that from shooting that bow so much, there was a spot that he knew that he, when he, his arms became mechanical where he could come down, he knew just exactly where it was going to be at. Because before he put the blindfold on, he took that step like that and he brought the bow like this and he found it in his body. He knew where it would be. And then he could blindfold himself and put that arrow, literally sometimes arrow into arrow. There's some friends of ours that used to shoot competition. And literally, there was times that they would bring home an arrow where they had shoot hit dead center and shoot another one and put it into the back end of the other arrow. I've seen them. They bring them home. Arrow into arrow. They could hit the mark. Can I tell you something? It takes practice. It takes work. It takes pressing toward the mark. And every person in this room, if you know Jesus Christ, your Savior, it's not just going to happen that you're going to grow in the Lord. You're going to have to press towards the mark. You're going to have to put forth some effort. Daily walking with God. Daily in fellowship. Daily speaking and talking with Him. Spending time with Him to hit the mark. But there's some in this room, you may not know Jesus Christ, your Savior. Can I tell you something? You've already missed the mark. If we was to go outside right now and we'd set up a target and I would take a bow and arrow and I would take a compound bow and we'd set it up out here and I would shoot at that target, more than likely I would miss the mark so wide you would be looking in the field out here for that <coughs> arrow. Can I tell you something? Without Christ, you're out in the field. Because that arrow would be lost. And without Christ, you're lost. Oh, how we need to hit the mark. And that mark is exactly this. Listen to me. Here's the mark. To know Him. To know Jesus Christ, first of all, Savior. Secondly, to know Him in fellowship. To walk with Him. To enjoy what He wants in our lives and to enjoy Him, enjoy the things of God. 
The purpose of this journey is to, of life is to build that relationship. To be able to draw near to, unto the Lord, we must purify our hearts and cleanse our ways. The re, for the, re, the reason for the Holy Spirit of God, uh, He convicts our hearts to show us a sin. And we need to confess that sin and make it right in our hearts and lives if we're going to hit the mark. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why? So we can hit the mark. So that we can know Him in a greater way. The better we know Him, the more we will desire to know Him in a greater way. Paul made the Lord a priority in his life. He said, I press toward the mark. He said, I made it a priority. He said, I press. He said, I used everything within me to hit the mark. He said, I've done everything that I could. I'd give it everything in my life to hit the mark. We've got to seek Him with all of our hearts, with a desire to fellowship with, with Him in, in all that we do. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. With all your heart. You want to hit the mark? Seek the Lord with all your heart. You want to fellowship with Him? Seek the Lord with all your heart. You want to have eternal life? Seek the Lord with all your heart and receive Him as your Savior. You want the Lord to be in control? Let Him have your heart and life. To seek the Lord in such a way as to love Him with all your heart. And I mentioned this verse a while ago, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. But there's going to be some obstacles along the way. The obstacles of the journey of life should bring us closer to the Lord instead of pushing us away. You know, every person in this room, you're going to go through difficulties in life. And people have told me, say, well, where is God? Right where He's always been. Where are you at? What? Yeah. A lot of times we say, where is God? He's right where He always was. The question is not where's God. The question is where are you at? Where are you at? You see, we treat God like a spare tire when He should be driving the car. And we only pull Him out for emergencies when He should be in control of all things of our lives. 2 Timothy 1.12 says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Paul was talking about what he suffered. He said, Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. The trials and tribulations should build our relationship with the Lord. If, if, we're truly, if we truly know Him as our Savior, when you go through a difficult time in your life, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, instead of pushing you away from the Lord, it ought to draw you closer to the Lord. Because you know who you can trust. Because you know that He's there for you. Because you know that He'll carry you through. Because you know that all things will turn out uh, uh, according to His will. It'll bring a sweetness into our life that we might know Him better. And there are those who claim to know Him who really don't. And we spoke about that already. And 1 John 2 says in here, by do, we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He that saith, I, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. We live in a time when a lot of people claim to know Jesus Christ, their Savior, but they're missing the mark in salvation, first of all. This morning, if you was to die right now, if you was to die this very moment, I'm not talking about next week, next month, next year, ten years from now. If you was to die right now, where would you be? You'll be somewhere, either in heaven or in a place called hell. And all this morning, don't miss the mark. Receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. We need to put our faith and trust Him as Savior that we might hit the mark. That we in this life, in this journey, uh, this journey called life, that we might know Him in a greater way. And Christian, this morning... The Lord wants you to know Him. He wants you to know Him in a greater and greater way. You say, well, preacher, I've been saved for 50 years. Can I know Him better? Yes. You say, well, I've been saved for 75 years. Can I know Him better? Yes. You can always know the Lord in a greater way.
Press towards the mark that you might know him. This week, you want know Vacation Bible School is about? Vacation Bible School is, yeah, we're going to have fun. But the whole purpose is this, that these kids might know him, that they might know him. I could plaster posters of professional ball players all over this place, and they can tell you who they are. They can tell you how many field goals they've made. They can tell you uh, how many home runs they've hit. They can, I mean, they can tell you all about them. They know them. But the one that they really need to know is Jesus Christ. And sitting in this room, many of we could do the same. And there's nothing wrong with knowing that. But the greatest one that you could know is Jesus Christ. Press toward the mark. This morning, if you know Jesus Christ, your Savior, you say, preacher, how to press toward the mark. We're going to give him an invitation. We're going to sing a song. I'm going to be standing down here in front. Why don't you come from wherever you're sitting and come to me here in the middle and we'll take a Bible and we'll show you how you can hit the mark and receive Christ as your Savior. Bullseye. And Christian, this morning, you know you're going to heaven, but how well do you know him? He says, I want you to know me. Paul, the, one of the greatest Christians that ever walked the face of earth. And Paul said, I count everything but loss that I might know him. That I might know him. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy and the opportunities that you've given us even this day. Maybe there's someone here that does know Christ their Savior. I pray that they'll come and let us take a Bible and show them how to be saved. That they might know you. Lord, be with every Christian. And help us to press toward the mark. That we might know you in a greater way. Have your will and way, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. Hunter, what are we going to sing?